Good morning to some of you. Good afternoon. Good evening. And, and thank you very much for uh, uh, joining us today uh, to this uh, um, uh, very uh, interesting uh, topic uh, that uh, uh, Sharon, um, uh, my colleague uh, from Arizona State University, suggested. Um, and uh, we at the Aga Khan Library are so uh, happy and glad, proud to uh, host this uh, uh, presentations uh, or seminar. Um, um, just, uh, I'll give a very quick introduction, not to waste uh, the speaker's time, uh, about the Aga Khan Library. And although relatively new uh, uh, name, Aga Khan Library, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that some of you haven't heard about the Aga Khan Library before uh, because, the, because of the name, but I just want to give you a bit of the historical background. The Aga Khan Library, new name, but it's 40 or 40 plus years uh, of collecting uh, materials on Islamic studies, Middle Eastern studies, and Ismaili studies. So the, the IS and ICMC libraries, uh, uh, before known as IS separate, uh, an Institute of Ismaili Studies and Institute for the Study of Muslim Civilizations libraries in 2014 joined together and created the Aga Khan Library. And now we move to a purpose-built building in King's Cross. And I hope that uh, for those of you who live in, in London or the UK, um, that you, you uh, had the chance to visit the building. Uh, if not, we invite you as soon as this uh, situation, uh, uncertain situation, uh, uh, goes away. I, I hope that you can get the chance and visit us in the new building and visit the library. Uh, and for those who are uh, world travelers, please, anytime you pass by London, uh, we, we, uh, we hope to welcome you in the Aga Khan Library. So the Aga Khan Library serves two institutions, the Institute of Ismaili Studies and the Aga Khan University Institute for the Study of Muslim Civilizations. Uh, collections, it's medium-sized library. Collections is around 55,000 volumes uh, uh, centered in Islamic studies, Middle Eastern studies, and Ismaili Shia studies. Um, I'll just give a quick uh, housekeeping uh, uh, issues here. Uh, I, I hope that you all keep your mics muted. Uh, we will have the chance uh, towards the end if you want to ask a question or you engage in a conversation after the speakers uh, finish their presentations and the discussion. Um, and if you want to use the chat, uh, uh, please, uh, feel free to uh, type any uh, question or comment you want to share with us. And without further ado, I, I would like to hand over to my colleague, Sharon, who is moderating this seminar. Uh, over to you, Sharon. Thank you, Ali. Thank you all for coming. And thank you to the Aga Khan University and Library for putting all of this together. I know it was not easy. Um, all of you uh, probably read the brief, so you know that we're here to talk about um, the digital landscape at a time of crisis and the crisis being initially COVID-19. Um, but moreover, we want to talk about, and we will talk about um, how this drive toward a digital world is impacted when it intersects with human rights. So we're really looking at human rights vis-a-vis -vis this emerging digital landscape. And we have three um, speakers today who are um, very much involved in this conversation and in this role. And so I'm going to briefly introduce them and then I'm going to hand it off uh, to Peter, Peter Herdrick, who is the co-founder of the Antiquities Coalition, which is an international NGO against looting and illicit trade in cultural heritage and cultural property. Um, and um, a good friend, so don't say anything. No, just kidding. And then um, following Peter, we will hear from Anand Gopal, who is a uh, assistant research professor at the Center for Religion and Conflict, Study of Religion and Conflict at ASU, and also uh, works with the Center on the Future of War. Um, he will discuss, um, he will introduce, I think, the uh, archive that brought us to this point where we wanted to have this discussion. Um, Anand, We'll speak second. And then John, John Carlson is a professor also at ASU. He's been a uh, professor of religious studies in the Center for Religion and Conflict. Also, he is co-directing the Recovering Truth Project and is a, a scholar of ethics. And he's editing, um, currently he has two books in the works and um, many other publications. And I won't go into them all because I really want the conversation to start. I think you're all going to have many, many 
uh, questions and discussions. So I'm very much looking forward to it. So Peter, I'm gonna hand it off to you and we'll get started. Yeah. Great. Thanks very much, Sharon. I appreciate that. And I'll just uh, share my screen in a minute. Uh, let me, uh, it's great to be back here at the library at, at uh, the AKU. And thanks to, our, to you, Sharon, as our organizer, to my fellow panelists, and to our moderator and my friend, the estimable, estimable Dr. Wally Daly. Uh, I'm Peter Herdrick. I'm the co founder of the Antiquities Coalition. It's an honor to be here and to consider some of the ethical questions that adhere to digitization, including how and where digital collections are created, the significant obstacles that often arise, and practitioners' ethical responsibilities beyond the realm of preservation and sustainability. So at this point, share my screen. So uh, let us begin uh, with a bit of background. I am uh, working on a number of digitization projects in libraries, museums, and other heritage collections in Southwestern Asia and in North Africa. And this stems from the Antiquities Coalition's mission, which is combating looting and the illicit trafficking of cultural materials. We do on the ground projects that support the fight and encourage cultural heritage preservation, collection security and information access. Now I see digitization as a cultural heritage preservation effort that assists in securing collections and information that is threatened by racketeering. Digitization serves as part of the direct pushback against illicit trafficking through inventory, documentation, proof of provenance, and the capacity to repatriate materials that might be looted. Okay. I'm also formerly the principal investigator of the Digital Library of the Middle East. Now, the DLME has two founding organizations, the Antiquities Coalition and the Council on Library and Information Resources. It's a digital platform, a virtual construction at which you can access records of cultural heritage materials from museums, libraries, archives, and other collections, cultural collections from around the world. The DLME stemmed from, uh, from this terrible incident, the arrival of Daesh fighters in Mosul, Iraq. Uh, I'm sure this is an event you all remember. For many people, myself included, it was a destruction that took place at the Mosul Museum that we recall. It's best known from the disgraceful video showing the damage wrought by Daesh extremists of electric drills taken to statues and sledgehammers wielded against sculpture. Uh, this photo shows the museum rather than showing the propaganda video. What fewer people may remember, though, is, is that this, uh, this paroxysm of, of Libricide uh, was, a, was uh, accompanied the, um, the attack on the museum. And in fact, that same week that the museum was attacked, the library was burnt to the ground. Uh, when that video was released, my colleague, Dr. Charles Henry of CLEAR, and I felt compelled to respond to the atrocity with a community effort. How could we work together and with other like-minded organizations and people like yourself to respond? We conceived the Digital Library of the Middle East. We went to the Stanford University Libraries for help on building a digital platform that would be flexible, interoperable, open source and open access, and most importantly, would allow us to federate records from the thousands of potential content partners around the world. Check-ins with those content custodians generated tremendous enthusiasm as people saw the value of creating a vast database of these cultural records accessible all in one place. Accessibility to data is the point of digital libraries after all, and the cultural heritage preservation and international policy communities also understood the value of creating digital records, especially, especially at collections where under that were under-resourced and did not have their materials inventoried, cataloged, documented, and digitized. So inventory, documentation, digitization, and federation would promote security, assist law enforcement in the case of looting or theft, allow for the continuity of information, and create digital surrogates in the face of heritage destruction. Uh, to put these benefits in context, I'd recommend this infographic that we've made at the Antiquities Coalition, How Databases Combat Looting. You can find it on our AC website or send me an email and I'll forward it to you for your use. Uh, at the AC, we do prioritize working in conflict zones where we can address these crises directly. 
My on the ground digitization projects are about building digital infrastructure mostly, all prioritize the preservation of cultural heritage and making it accessible, and all work in collaboration with and in service to our local partners. So let us get to the ethical questions we face in the, in the field. Uh, we begin in Yemen. In 2015, civil war broke out between the internationally recognized government and the Houthi rebels. It's been a bitter struggle that the United Nations now calls the worst humanitarian crisis in the world today. The human toll on the people in Yemen is staggering. There's a lack of food, of medicine, access to clean water, breakdown of sanitation, and more than 1 million Yemenis have contracted cholera. All this in the fifth poorest country in the world where GDP per capita is approximately $913 for 2019. There are relatively few resources for, cultural, for the cultural heritage sector. Yemen is culturally and archaeologically rich, and these sources are under threat. This is the old city of Sana'a. It's inscribed on the UNESCO list of World Heritage Sites. The Houthi rebels now control the city. Uh, this is sort of a well-known view. You've probably seen it before of the capital's architectural riches. And during the ongoing civil war, it's been the site of bombing and the destruction of historic buildings. Uh, here's another example of the uh, destruction wrought in Yemen. This is the museum in the city of Damar. It was attacked by Saudi warplanes. It held thousands of objects recovered from one of Yemen's most archaeological rich regions and was targeted by a series of precision airstrikes. The relatively new museum, which was only a decade old and also housed the provincial office of Yemen's General Organization for Antiquities and Museums, or FOAM, was completely leveled and turned into rubble, with only the building's underground storerooms possibly surviving. This photo here illustrates the resilience of the team at the Damar Museum. It's a team of uh, 16 museum professionals, university faculty and students, and local volunteers who are excavating and sifting through the rubble of the destroyed museum to recover the pieces of Damar's past. They're actually excavating their own museum. This project is funded by the Council of American Overseas Research Centers, Capital, Kaplan Responsive Preservation Initiative. And it's clear that the cultural, the cultural heritage of Yemen is, uh, the threat to the cultural heritage of Yemen is deadly serious and one of worldwide concern. Against this backdrop in 2019, Yemen's Minister of Culture, Mr. Marwan Damaj, suggested, and we readily agreed, that we work at a major museum in the country, collaborating on inventory, documentation, and digitization of the collection. You'll see in a moment that there are many security and safety issues involved with ethical implications. Uh, so I'm not gonna identify the museum today. Here though are some views of the storage area. And as you can see, reorganization, reshelving, conservation, record keeping, and digitization would certainly be beneficial. I'll show you another view. Uh, here we go. Uh, in 2019, we received an emergency grant from the Alif Foundation in Geneva to work with the Egyptian Heritage Rescue Foundation on an emergency project uh, to, to do the inventory photography and, the, and create a digital database of the collection at the museum. Uh, we met first in Cairo to train Yemeni colleagues on necessary skills, and then the pandemic struck. Yemen shut down and our project shut down with it. This brought up a series of ethical challenges related to the pandemic and to these security questions. Now, the museum has been looted in the past with all the coins taken by gunmen. There are also ongoing conflicts among local warring political factions, including shellings and bombings. And of course, there was the danger of the civil war itself. Uh, we all know the, the violent extremists uh, have looted and trafficked Yemeni heritage and that this collection contains historically significant materials of great value. So the government in Yemen recognized this set of circumstances uh, and that it was uh, full of risk for everyone. And they locked the collection behind metal doors at the museum for security purposes. Now I'm going to, at this point, stop the share so I can look at you directly. Uh, okay, and if you can see me, I'll go ahead. I'll assume we can. <laughs> so the question is, so how can we inventory a collection that's locked away? Well, we can't, obviously. 
And we've been waiting for the Yemeni government to open the collection to us when they determine that the situation is secure enough to ensure the collections are safe from conflict and criminality. So what's our role here? You know, in some cases we might want to forge ahead and, you know, and we might be chomping at the bit to get this accomplished. It's an emergency situation. We recognize that it has been looted already. This is not a, a theoretical construct. This is an actual construct in a country that's really in great, um, mis that faces great misfortune. But what we have decided to do is to try to be patient. Um, this is not necessarily the case for everybody who would be in this situation, I, I dare say. But I mentioned that we try to work in service to our local partners, and I think this is an important point. I think it's also served us well. It's really not us up to us as, uh, as international um, partners to make decisions about how our project should, prog should progress in the face of conflict or danger especially. All our colleagues are aware of this and everyone's in full agreement. So we have, we have been patient since 2019, waiting to get access to these collections. Now, there's a related eth ethical issue I'd like to draw attention to related to this as well, and that's the pandemic. The healthcare system in Yemen is strained to the point of breaking. There's not much advanced care available for COVID patients, and there's a high fatality rate among those who are infected. Now, so the question is, by starting digitization and asking our museum employees to gather to work on collections, would that also create risk for them? And I think the answer is obviously yes. So before we get started, we are now discussing work rules that'll guide us when we are able to return to this work. Now, preservation and sustainability of the collection is the goal of most digitization work. And in this context, we continue to put safety, security, and the challenges to our Brave Museum colleagues at the forefront of decision-making, even though we are working in an emergency. I think that's important. Uh, and this brings us really, though, to a question that I think is one of the most important ethical questions that we do face. It was, it was to check on an assumption to, that underlies really much of our entire enterprise. Is the process of digitization beneficial to the local communities and individuals with whom we work? In Yemen, this is particularly urgent, I think. We see digitization and, and as a component, we, we I, I would say uh, collections, uh, library people, museum people, archive people, we see digitization as a component of digital humanities. But in Yemen, it's also a humanitarian crisis. Now, I asked our partners in Yemen what they thought specifically about this issue. Did they think that our efforts might be better spent in trying to provide food or medicine or ensuring up the healthcare system? And I can report that the answer I heard was unanimous. The cultural heritage of Yemen is critical to us, our interlocutors said. It reminds us of who we are and where we come from. It tells us the stories that inspire and it's at risk. Our, so our international and local team can bring our specific expertise to these problems while others bring their expertise to those other challenges of medicine, of food, of water, et cetera. They, their message was pretty, pretty simple, really. It was stick to your knitting, Peter, and know that this work is valued as a humanitarian contribution as well. So this also puts me in mind of the moments after the attack on the museum and the library in Mosul. You might recall a desire that you had to do something about the destruction. I spoke to the Middle East Library, Asso library Association shortly after the attack about our aborting plans at the DLMA. And at the end of that presentation, one of the librarians in the audience approached me and said, Peter, I want to help. I'm not going to put on a blue helmet uh, and, uh, and, and pick up a gun and join a peacekeeping force. But if you need someone to help with cataloging, with metadata or library policy, I know Arabic and I'm your person. Turn to me. I think that that really is a measure of how many of us feel about the value of cultural heritage materials and how we can help. And I'll also say that it was at that meeting at which I met Walid, I met Ahmed Demiran, my partner on our just concluded project to build the first functional digital library in Iraq, and Sharon Smith, I would say, was the organization's president at the time. So it was a good conference. Now, there's much more to say on all these topics, and I hope you'll submit questions and that we can discuss these issues in depth. I don't want to run over, but I would like to tell you briefly about another project I'm directing on digitization of national heritage collections at the Ministry of uh, Culture in Algeria. As part of that, we recently held a three-part regional conference on manuscripts, preservation, and digitization with, rep with representatives from Algeria, Libya, Mauritania, Morocco, and Tunisia. Uh, I point out that our uh, producer on that, uh, Helena A. Rose is in the audience tonight. Hello, Helena. 
Uh, we spoke with researchers from the region who told us of outstanding manuscripts across the area in private collections in some of the most inhospitable and distant locations on earth. Many of them, not completely, but, but almost completely unrevealed, at least to outside uh, experts. Now, of course, there's a strong instinct to survey, to identify, to geolocate and map these treasures and make them available to scholars and to scholars, to local communities, to broader local communities and to the interested public. But what are our ethical responsibilities here? And I know we're gonna discuss this. Would the publication of these locations bring the wrong kind of attention? We need to look no further than Mali, directly to the south, to recall the havoc wrought by violent extremists there. I, now, I mention this because I know my colleagues have wrestled with this themselves and have quite a story to tell about that. We can look forward to hearing it in just a minute. So, Sharon, with that, I'll turn it back to you and look forward to the discussion later. Thank you very much, Peter. That was very interesting. And everyone, we will have questions later. Um, I'm going to now turn it over to my colleague at ASU, Anand Gopal, to talk about the um, discussions that led up to this conference for us. Anand, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sharon. It's great to be here. Um, I thought I would start by describing this uh, unique collection that Sharon, John, and I have been working on that um, comes out of Syria and um, maybe begin with some of the background. Uh, some of you may know it, but so just bear with me if you do. But uh, in 2011, there was uh, mass protests that broke out in Syria and other Arab countries. Uh, which uh, morphed into a full-blown revolution that involved millions of Syrians against the dictatorship of Bashar al-Assad. Uh, and eventually the Bashar uh, turned his weapons on his own people, uh, bombed and gassed them. And in the course of this, uh, there were many parts of the country that uh, became liberated from the regime's hold and functioned as quasi-independent uh, territories. And in the, that was around 2012 that that began. And in the process of that, there were many activists on the ground, Syrian revolutionaries, who uh, began to produce all sorts of local media, um, including radio and, um, and newspapers. And most of this, especially the newspapers, weren't material that was found online. It was um, you know, very old fashioned, just printed, oftentimes in, um, in broadsheet and distributed either for free or for a very nominal sum on the streets of very small towns and villages and cities across, across Syria. And uh, these, uh, these materials were, I think, a rep representation of a type of flowering of political and civic activity that took place in a country that had been under a dictatorship for 40 years and in a country in which um, the state had controlled all media and all forms of expression. So, uh, you know, you had in many cases, people who had no background whatsoever in media or journalism or writing, um, picking up the pen for the first time and um, coming together and making these uh, publications. So um, it's something I've been very interested in the course of my work and my travels in Syria. And so I began to, collect some of these uh, publications just as I came across them in, in uh, rebel-held territories over the years. And um, about five, six years later, um, I've, uh, me and some colleagues on the ground have amassed a collection of about 200 or 250 different titles of uh, publications. And some of these are weeklies, some of these are monthlies, um, some of these are, uh, you know, they run the political gamut, some are secular and left-wing. Some are uh, Islamist um, and everything in between. Some are apolitical. There's children's magazines, there's women's magazines and newspapers. Um, some of these were published uh, continuously for four or five years until the territory was taken over by another force, either by the Syrian regime or by ISIS. Um, some of these just had a, a short run, maybe a month or two. But um, taken together, the corpus, uh, I think, represents a pretty unique uh, look uh, at a conflict, uh, a real-time look, because as I said, many of these were weekly. And so you could read the pages of these newspapers and get a, a really granular look at kind of the blow by blow of a very complicated civil war. 
Um, and so it, that's one that's one of its great values, I think. And there's not, to my knowledge, anything like that in any of the conflicts of our modern time, uh, where most of you know these civil wars are intensely local, and most of the important events are happening and aren't really being recorded. Uh, unless foreign media or national media in the countries are able to record it. But here you have the really intimate stories of people's lives as um, they try to come together to figure out how to, on the one hand, if they're in um, non-government territory, how to do basic things like keep the lights on and keep the trash collected, as well as their experiences under bombardment, uh, in some cases under the deployment of chemical weapons by the Syrian regime. So it's an extraordinary set of historical documents. Um, beyond that, it's also a very interesting set of documents for trying to, um, for giving us an in some insight into the ways in which Syrians were making sense of what was happening to them. And that was uh, one of the things that was most striking to me as I read through some of the pages of, of these uh, of these documents, which is that it wasn't just hard news. There was also opinion columns. There were uh, philosophical essays. There were debates. There were um, locals who are trying to, uh, you know, contend with uh, the traditions of their own community and writers from Syria and from the Arab world and put them into dialogue with uh, writers from the Western tradition. So, you know, in the small town of Membej, for example, which has a population of about 100,000 in it's in northern Syria. Uh, this is a city that, uh, like most other cities in Syria before 2011, had two state run newspapers uh, and no independent media. And then after the city was liberated from regime control in 2012, there were 11 newspapers in the city alone. And you could find you know, there's uh, one of my favorite uh, examples is a, a long debate on the question of uh, secularism and people citing John Locke and also people citing other really important thinkers from the Islamic tradition. Uh, so it, it's uh, in that sense, I found it to be an extraordinary set of documents as well, just to give us insight into the way people are thinking and working through what they're experiencing. Um, and in terms of our process and, and the ethical concerns uh, around it, uh, what we've tried to do is collect these documents um, with the consent, of course, of the publishers of these of these materials. Uh, in most cases, uh, these the areas that I'm describing were taken over by the Syrian regime or by ISIS or by another another force, the Kurdish-backed forces. And in all cases, the publications had to stop. So um, there's very few areas in the country now where these uh, publications still continue. And so many of the uh, individuals involved in the publications face a choice of what to do with the materials. And tragically, in some cases, they burn the materials. So when ISIS was taking was coming into an area, um, they would burn the, um, the archives that they had. In some cases, all that was left was, for example, the original digital versions on, on like a, a flash drive, and they would uh, sneak that out of the country if they could. Um, there are many uh, newspapers and magazines that have been lost in this process. So uh, we felt an imperative to try to uh, save these while we could. And so working with the original publishers, we've um, amassed, like I said, a collection of about 200 or 250 different titles. Um, and the aim is to try to first just to preserve them. And secondly, uh, most they are already digitized, most of them, because we're getting the original digital versions uh, since the heart of the paper copies have been destroyed. But the, uh, the second aim is to try to make some of this material accessible to scholars and to journalists and to Syrians who may benefit from reading this uh, snapshot of Syrian history. Uh, the challenge we face in doing so is that these newspapers have the uh, have are full of names, so names of um, authors and names of other individuals, and of course um, that puts the individuals in question in great danger. So we, uh, you know, our thinking is to to make make the access to these documents extremely limited and vetted, so that people. Um, at least at this initial stage, so that researchers and uh, others uh, are able to access it, but it doesn't, so it's not widely disseminated yet, so that it doesn't put people in danger. 
In addition to that, we've been discussing um, the possibility of anonymizing names, um, you know, dig digitally anonymizing or removing or blacking out certain names, redacting them so that people aren't um, put in danger. The third and I think most important ethical concern for us is that um, uh, I think I, and I'm probably speak for my colleagues here, see us as perhaps holding this in, in trust for the moment, uh, but the, this is a resource that really belongs to the Syrians and that we want to figure out a way that ultimately return this to the Syrians. Um, and if there's ever a situation where the conditions on the ground in Syria change and it becomes possible to house this locally, then that I think me personally, that's what I would love and that's the aim. But of course, um, these are all tricky ethical questions. There's many other examples like this, for example, in Iraq, where there's documents that have been taken out of Iraq. Um, and um, Iraqis, I think, justly see that um, it's a resource that belongs inside Iraq. Uh, and Iraq is in a different state where that's possible. In Syria, it's much, much trickier. But um, these are some of the, these are just examples of some of the ethical questions that uh, we're contending with and not necessarily saying that we have answers to, and we'd love to hear from, from all of you about your thoughts and opinions on this. But uh, that's, yeah, that's basically what I wanted to say about the, uh, we're calling it the Syrian Democratic Revolution Archive. And um, yeah, thank you very much for your time and we'll look forward to your, your comments. Thank you, Hanan. Thank you very much. That's a great summary of what we're looking at and trying to sort through. Um, and just quickly, I wanted to add, you know, this is a local voice that you're not going to find anywhere else. And this is why it's so important, because it's different from a government voice, different from a radical extremist voice. Um, it's incredibly important. And with regard to Baghdad, as someone who at MIT receives a lot of material from Baghdad, um, mostly architects' archives and photographs. Um, yes, the architects would have preferred that these were remaining in Baghdad, but at the time there was no infrastructure. And when we took them into MIT, it was always my sense and what I projected was that these are the Iraqi materials that belong to Iraq, and we are lucky enough to hold them until such time, and they can access them digitally as well. But anyway, I'm moving on now to John Carlson my other esteemed colleague at ASU, who will discuss this even further. Thank you, John. Thank you, Anand. Uh, thank you, Sharon. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, Eid Mubarak, to uh, all those who are observing. It's, uh, it's great to be with you here. And I want to thank Sharon and uh, for, for organizing this panel and uh, uh, Waleed the Aga Khan Library for, for hosting us uh, today. Um, I, I come to this conversation uh, sort of in two capacities. One, by training in, in the academy as an ethicist, which is a, a field of philosophy, a religious thought that uh, thinking about questions about the good life. Um, but uh, that's the kind of broad conceptual rubric. But obviously, we have some very specific uh, and practical questions that we're taking up uh, in, in this context with this project having to do um, with decisions about um, access and thinking about these these projects. So I'll try to say a little bit about how my training, my, my own uh, uh, reflection on those themes has informed uh, my, my uh, involvement in the project. Um, the, uh, the other thing, though, is that I, I'm, I direct the Center for the Study of Religion and Conflict, which is a research center at Arizona State uh, which is, you know, it's our mission is to study religion's relationship to conflict, both for good and for ill. So uh, we, we try to nurture and grow, sustain and preserve uh, important research. And um, those are particularly on themes of religion and violence and war, but also religion and democracy, religion and social justice, social and political form, not I like to tell people that not all conflict is something to be avoided. Some conflict needs to be embraced and is a necessary component of progress uh, and reform. So um, it's not just about uh, uh, the, the viol violence, et cetera. So uh, when I heard uh, in, uh, about this project from, from Anand, um, I, was, uh, I, I was really intrigued and delighted and um, was very, very eager to try to pr find a way for us to, to uh, in the center that Anon is also part of, to, to be able to, to get behind the project and sustain it and, um, <clears throat> and make some advances in it as well. Um, so 
the and and I'll just start by saying one of the biggest challenges that we have had, and this is this is this is this is probably my the one point that I would I would foot stomp right now, is getting funding to translate these materials and to make make them available. And we are a very successful uh, research organization. Uh, we've been involved in dozens and dozens of research grants involving millions of dollars of external funding. And this is one project that has been surprisingly difficult to fund. And I'm just not quite sure why that is. Um, but I want to offer a little bit of a case for why uh, we should, uh, why the, the world should be concerned with this um, and, uh, and, and why, you know, this is something that we're going to continue to press ahead on um, uh, in, in spite of the challenges that, we, that we've faced. Uh, one of the biggest set of questions that Peter and Anand have both raised in their comments is for whom do these resources exist, right? Uh, who, who, who are the proprietary owners of these materials? Um, <clears throat> and I'm not sure that I have one distinct answer. On the, on the one hand, of course, Syrians are the, the, uh, are the authors, the generators, the consumers of all of these local uh, Revolutionary Council papers. And um, and they've uh, you know been able to you know show just how um, how vibrant and rich that uh, that period of time was before these these independent communities uh, and towns were crushed by the regime um, and it's they were writing for each other. They weren't writing necessarily for external audiences. So on the one hand, it is really, you know, their material. Uh, and as Anand said, we, we definitely want to preserve this material for them so that it will be part of their, um, the part of their history when they are ever in a position to, you know, reclaim this, that it will be there, will not have been destroyed. We're, we're kind of, in that regard, temporary custodians. But, one also has to think that in this age in which we have now witnessed, we, the world on global media, have witnessed the destruction of precious antiquities, um, whether that's statues and art or experiments in self-government. This is a precious antiquity too. This newspapers are precious. Uh, then there is something else at stake you one realizes that well one people doesn't just have sole ownership such that if someone comes in and takes over and destroys these things that he says well that's not that's not ours there's a resource that's lost to the whole world in that regard and um and and that's important for for us and i want to speak really kind of from a western american point of view uh because what one finds as anand was talking about in these in these um, in these Revolutionary Council papers, is a, a really deep and vigorous uh, wrestling with questions that are questions that any people who uh, esteem democracy and esteem freedom and justice and good governance uh, and responsive governments, everyone should care about, and. In the United States, especially, that's that seems that seems important because we claim that democracy is a kind of universal value, that it should be pursued, and that we want to, as a matter of foreign policy, promote it around the world. And the United States has not always done a very good job doing that. Uh, and it's important, I think, now that this project has gone on for it stretched a a, a decade now. There, there are different periods in U.S. history recently that, that kind of help us think about the, uh, the context in which these, um, these, uh, these, these papers uh, have, have, have lived through. Um, you know, it was after, uh, I mean, the, pro the project looks different at different times, I guess is what I want to say. I mean, if you, when we were first starting to think about some of these topics and, um, 
and, and looking through these papers, you know, it was still in the wake of, um, of, Iraq, of the Iraq war after, it was after the Iraq war, of course, but, um, you know, that was, uh, you know, the lesson and the upshot of that, uh, of that experience was quite understandably and clearly that invading a country and occupying a country is not the way to promote democracy. But I think what also happened um, at that time was that um, people started to, you know, we were, we were beginning to kind of turn our backs on questions. The people were coming to sort of different answers about these questions and it had to do with a deep um, amb ambivalence about, uh, about, about the compatibility between democracy and Islam, or whether democracy could survive in the uh, in uh, it could prevail in the Arab, in the Arab world, um, and you know we are now in a position in in the United States where I'm not even sure that democracy is uh, thriving and prevailing here right now. So, for all of those who thought that or questioned whether we should be committed in in um, to, to supporting democracy. And we saw a very, very kind of ambivalent um, uh, effort among in, under the uh, Obama administration. We now stand, and we, we've more recently stood in a time during the, during the previous administration where it's not even clear that democracy is something that we, cher we cherish anymore. So these really are universal questions and when you get into the thick of these papers, you realize that people are wrestling with questions that are fundamentally human questions. How do we pursue freedom in, in a society? How do we ensure uh, liberty? How do we secure basic human goods? Uh, how do we ensure this justice is available? And th these, are, these are questions that we all have some kind of stake in and we need to understand, I think, that you know, much as parts of the Western world were, were enthralled when your Eastern Europe was undergoing its velvet revolutions and turns towards democracies, now parts of Eastern Europe are turning away from democracy. Um, we see that in other parts of the world as well. And certainly it's, it's evident when you read these papers. So we do really feel there's some obligation as well to make sure these stories are shared well beyond Syrian, um, uh, Syrian society so that people can understand just what's at stake, what's, what's the Syri what Syrians have gone through, uh, the, the intense um, kinds of struggles and, and incredible courage that they've shown to, to do this, and that many of the things that we think are so vital to our society, um, to a democratic society, pursuit of freedom, the role of civil society, journalism, the role of uh, uh, local organizations, of self-rule, of self-government, being little r republicanism, that was what we would what we would call that, right? To not be dominated or oppressed by another, but to be able to rule oneself. These are long-standing um, human concerns that predate the era of democracy as well. Um, these things are very, very much evident uh, in, in Syria. And so I think it, as someone who has been involved in this work of thinking about the relationship between religion and democracy, and who has understood for quite some time the the deep suspicion that um, many Westerners had that you know, whether Islam is compatible with democracy, um, these uh, or whether you know Arabs are ready for self-rule, to put that in the most condescending kinds of terms, uh, a quick review of these papers answers that qu those questions immediately, uh, and in many cases serves as a model that we should be thinking, we in the West should be thinking about and looking to, and understanding just how much people have to put on the line uh, to secure basic freedoms that many of us here take for granted every day. And it's not an oppressive government that's making us wear masks, right? It's an oppressive government that's shooting at nonviolent protesters, right? That's, there's a big difference there. So uh, in, in sum, that's what I would, uh, would, would say that we have, um, uh, we in the West have, to, and 
and, and beyond Syria have to learn from these papers. And uh, while I very much agree with Anand, we want to be custodians and, and return at some point these, uh, this, these papers to a, to a free Syria, uh, we also want to make sure that these stories are widely available from beyond it. So, thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, I would like to turn it over now to uh, Walid Ghali um, from the Aga Khan Library and University to sort of um, to begin a discussion with the panelists. So, and then we'll be taking questions from the audience. Walid. Well, thank you very much, Sharon. Um, and for the speakers, of course. Uh, uh, who left me speechless now, <laughs> because uh, it's so rich presentations, uh, uh, despite the short time. Um, and uh, let me start with, uh, with Peter, as uh, he, he always surprises us. And then this is the third time, or maybe fourth time, I, I hear uh, Peter in, in such presentations. Uh, uh, one of them was uh, at the Aga Khan University last year. And, and what's fascinating about Peter, Peter's presentations is always, he sh always share with us new thing, a new country, new, uh, new photos, uh, new, new, new conflict, uh, new problems, new challenges. And, and I, was, I was really thinking um, um, while he was, he was uh, uh, presenting on Yemen especially, and, and the way that he even uh, um, had the, 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 the museum um, uh, for, for, for ethical reasons. And I think this is, this is a real example of uh, our work um, as librarians, uh, archivists, uh, uh, academics, uh, but also it raises lots of uh, questions about, uh, um, about the knowledge. Uh, I, again, I can see lots of names around us here in, in this seminar uh, who works as Islamic studies or Middle Eastern studies uh, librarian. And I think they, they, will, they will be concerned about the, the access to knowledge as well. Um, uh, when and how we could access uh, this type of knowledge um, and while we think about people uh, and the human as well. Um, and, and here I, I, I really, my, my, my focus or my concern um, uh, or my, my question, direct question to, to Peter, um, how would he advise us to function uh, as archivists and librarians and maybe uh, academics like John here, here with us as well? In, in, in these kind of uh, instances. Um, uh, uh, but also, I, I like Peter talking about uh, connecting his work, current work, to the pandemic as well, uh, which I, I think lots of presentations, lots of even publications have been uh, issued in the last year and a couple of months about uh, the new work environment. And when it comes to digitization and working with heritage manuscripts, and uh, uh, precious items, uh, I think one need to come up with a, a new approach, uh, especially if, if this uncertainty uh, stayed with us for, for, for longer. Um, I, I hope not, of course, but I mean, I think we, we need to prepare ourselves. We need to prepare the, the, the ground. Uh, and thanks, Peter, to bringing to the, uh, uh, your presentation, the discussion with the Middle East Librarian Association a couple of years ago, but because it was really helpful and useful for us and myself uh, personally to meet with you and know about the project and the, uh, the digital library of the Middle East. And, and I'm sure that uh, this connection uh, made, made the project uh, uh, or gave some credit to the project in, in, uh, in the work that you're doing as well. And, and still, I, I, I wanted, like I did last time, I wanted to stress on, on, the, uh, uh, on your website, the digital library of the Middle East website, where you, you clearly stating preserve, access, and inspire. And I think you, you, you the, the quote that you shared with us, share some inspiration uh, from, from Yemen, but also left us in a, in a dilemma. I, I would come to this when I discuss with John, uh, the, uh, the preservation versus access. Uh, we, we can preserve, uh, but we need to access in, in most of the cases, uh, um, um, especially if it's, uh, uh, Material at risk, uh, so research needs to be involved in in, in these uh, in these materials. Um, and I'll move on. I'll ask general questions, and then I'll leave I'll leave the the speakers uh, uh, if they want to answer or to come back to comment on one of my uh, general questions. 
Uh, Anan, thank you very much for sharing uh, this valuable information with us. Um, I, I didn't know about this project. I was surprised about the, uh, the, the number of the material and, and uh, uh, resources that you've, you've been collecting. And um, straight away, my, uh, my librarian antenna or hat started to work and, and how, how, how one should, should utilize these resources, how one should preserve these resources uh, if it's if it's on on uh, images or even on the physical print material, how one should work on preserving it, but not only for the current research purposes, but for, for future generation. I think that's that's the major question here. We we need to preserve it for future generation because it, it is still very hot uh, uh, conflict. It's still in action. Um, and I don't think that uh, even if we if we run a research on this material, uh, that will give us a real or clear uh, image uh, on the current state. So I think the, the major question here that how, how can we preserve this for future researchers and future generations uh, for many uh, reasons, to be honest. Um, um, access still uh, in Anand's presentation um, is a, a major point, but also I'm, I'm so thankful for him uh, and appreciate his concern about the human, uh, human rights as well. And um, the, the risk that these material can form on a people who are currently in a conflict. So uh, they don't need more conflict to be added to their shoulders, in fact. Um, uh, but also I think I think that's my, again, it's my perspective that um, this project can be expanded if you encourage more people to come up or to come up with more resources or to share the resources if they get some um, assurance that there is no risk will be onto them in the future. I think it, it, it requires a slight work on disseminating information about your work or this project to people who might come up or, or bring forward more material and this would benefit all of us in the future, uh, uh, certainly. Um, I'm, I'm happy to work uh, with you, to think with you, most of the librarians and scholars in this seminar can give us more thoughts as well on how to build up on the, uh, the foundation of, uh, of this project that you and John have been working on. Um, uh, so thank you very much for uh, bringing to our attention this uh, valuable project, uh, but also I'd love to, to hear from you um, on how to build on, on this base that you already uh, did. Um, John, uh, thank you very much again. Um, I had a big, very big question in the beginning when Peter started to, to talk, and then when you started to, uh, uh, to present, I said, yeah, it, it, the question is to you specifically, uh, w at universities when we work with um, ethics committees. And I'm sure that you have uh, such experience uh, at Arizona State University. And I, I wanted to ask you, maybe you enlighten us and uh, tell us how, how, how do you present to the ethics committee if, if it happens uh, in this project or any other project? How, how do you work with ethics committee uh, in similar projects? I'm sure that you will have lots of questions about um, uh, risks at people, risk um, in terms of uh, politics. Um, but to, uh, you, you left me myself, uh, uh, especially in a bit of a dilemma, uh, two minds thinking about um, um, access to knowledge, the important uh, 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 matter for librarians and for archivists, access to knowledge and the hunger to knowledge as well. I mean, if you look around, Researchers are, uh, uh, nowadays in, 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 uh, in all disciplines are uh, very hungry to knowledge, especially about uh, conflict areas and uh, uh, um, maybe uh, pr precious items and precious resources. Uh, but also you hinted to the impact, the negative impact of this knowledge onto people and human rights. But again, before you finish, you, you hinted, you alluded to the positive impact uh, of this knowledge to policymakers. 
So now it's it's a real it's a real dilemma. We we access knowledge to who and how and what's the universities? I mean, academics in universities and universities and in the bigger uh, uh, picture can help in disseminating this knowledge to the right, at least if if I'm allowed to use the right uh, stakeholders uh, or to phase access these knowledges or this knowledge to the stakeholders because. Uh, I, I agreed with you in the beginning about the negative impact, but when you mentioned that it can inform the policy makers, especially in the Western side, and I said, no, I mean, yes, we, we can't prevent this knowledge from going to the right people to tell them, look, I mean, our, our analysis here can tell you something. You might be a trunk. You, you might be mistaken thinking or doing something uh, under a, a, a certain perspective or uh, uh, principle. Uh, so I will leave this to you to, to answer, to be honest, how, how would we deal with this uh, equation, hunger to knowledge, uh, access to knowledge, uh, but also the negative versus positive impact. And, and here positive, um, I would take, I would quote you, informing the policy maker uh, uh, on, on the conflict area and, and the the, um, the importance of such material that you've collected uh, to inform decision making uh, or policy making. I'm not going to uh, to take long here, but I just want to uh, to wrap up with uh, uh, probably few general uh, questions or maybe two general questions um, uh, about what what exactly the ethics that we we need to take into account. Uh, when we work with um, uh, pri priceless, precious items, and in my in my case, is always manuscripts. Uh, and I, I know Peter works with antiquity, uh, and and here we have Anand talk, uh, talking about very contemporary uh, research material. So uh, priceless or precious in terms of uh, information doesn't mean heritage. It can also mean things that being published last year or even today. Uh, so what ethics that we need to uh, take into account, I'm talking about librarians and the archivists here uh, uh, sp specifically. And also from your experience, so through three of you, what challenges that you, you found working with certain government? And here I will, I will keep it open and general, government from both sides, government in, in the Middle East and Islamic countries and the conflict areas and government and where you, you function, your universities and your institutions, uh, i.e. Europe or the United States. I will stop here, uh, Sharon, I don't want to take longer, uh, but I'm sure that the speakers would have a few comments as well to share with us. And thank you very much for these fascinating presentations. Thank you, Walid. Um, and John, Peter, please um, feel free to answer or discuss, and then we'll open it to the floor for questions. I can get started, Sharon, uh, with just a couple of observations. First, I'd like to say that I thought um, my two co-presenters' uh, presentations were great, and, and it was really terrific to learn, especially about the specifics of the Syrian archive. That's really, uh, you know, it reminds us, too, that, that as Wally just said, that priceless and precious material can be can be created, you know, in an instant and can be created today as well as it can uh, hundreds and thousands of years ago. So that's important to remember. But I, and I also want to just say what John said, I wrote it down, for whom do these resources exist? I think that that is a critical question in all this. And, and I like to think of it, I, I sort of alluded to this a little bit, you know, some, we're doing digital humanities, but in some, time, in some cases, this is a humanitarian issue as well, I believe. I believe that, you know, that a lot of this information really does have a strong place in people's hearts, and it's part of how they see themselves and, and how they want to be seen in the world and how they can prevent being misunderstood sometimes. So I think those are, uh, those are all really Im important questions. To whom do these... Um, to, for whom are, 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 do these resources exist? Now, we, we do see it, too, from our lens in the West. We see it as our, through our lens as scholars, as, as uh, you know, information professionals, that sort of thing, too. And I want to I just tell one more, uh, say one more 
instance or one more lesson, I guess, that I've learned. And that is that really the incredible importance of being flexible at all this. Uh, you can't, it, it's, it's hard. Well, I, I'll put it this way, mate. You know, I'm a I'm a former journalist, so I'm a little bit addicted to narrative, and so I always want to tell a story to to, to uh, illustrate what it is I'm I'm thinking about. But but in this case, it, it starts here. Uh, you know, I used to work at the Archaeological Institute of America. We felt very strongly about you know many things. It's a it's a learned society, and you know, and then I've gotten involved in professional societies of librarians, of archivists, of museum people who feel the same way. One of the things that I was raised on was the incredible importance of open source open access right that every that information wants to be free we should all have access to it and that that and that is often and i would say this too for funders it's very important as well there's funders who insist that you that you know you do this work and that you make it available they want to see their investment in in uh, money for for equipment for digitization go to something where it will be a, a, a broadly used uh, resource perfectly understandable but the last thing I alluded to was was were these manuscripts out in many cases out in the far reaches of the Saharan Desert in uh, in in places that are far away and where they don't have resources to you know to store and maintain, conserve, protect, preserve in the way we might like to see, and where it would be nice to know if you were a scholar, or, uh, you know that that. Um, the sort of research material you might want to take a look at exists and where it is and maybe you could get a copy or maybe it could be digitized that sort of thing but what i've what i've become more flexible with is the idea that there by doing that we may be creating a dangerous situation and the and the instance i'd like to cite which i think is a, a very interesting one is at the metropolitan museum of art and with professor zena bahrani of columbia who does the mapping mesopotamia project She's very strong on the idea that no, I'm never going to release this information. She does uh, landscape surveys in northern Iraq, and she walks the ground with her team, and they take photographs and they get geolocation references. And she says, if I were to publish it, if we were to make that widely available, we would effectively draw a map for people with, uh, you know, who might want to go and loot and and pull stuff out of the ground and and sell it into the illicit market. And that's not the purpose of this. And she feels very strongly about that. And I see, I absolutely see that in relation to what's what uh, these these tremendous, this tremendous manuscript tradition across the Maghreb. And, uh, you know, in, in that part of the world, we've already seen that kind of attack. We've seen attacks by um, violent extremists on cultural materials. It's gone to the International Criminal Court, for goodness sake. And so we know that uh, that, that is an existing possibility and we have to take that into account. So all that is to say uh, that we need to be a little bit flexible on these, that, that um, it's hard that there's there will be examples where we'll where we'll come that will come up against where we are our, our strongly held beliefs may be challenged. Thank you, Peter. I, I fully agree with you. And I think as librarians and archivists, we really um, the first thought is open access. How can we make everything open? And that ha that has changed during COVID, when everyone was screaming for digital everything. We had to stop and take a breath and say hold on, everything can't be digital because it, there's a human cost. And I don't think we really stopped to think about that in the West before. We really were pushing for open everything. And now we know that's not possible. And there's a lot more thinking and consideration that has to be taken. And I've got John. Uh, yeah, thanks, um, Waleed, for your comments and questions. Uh, I think for your, your question on how to build a foundation for this project, I think it ties in directly to John's point, which to my mind is the most important question here is who is this material for? And I think there's two answers to that question that are, um, I, I guess, uh, work in concert. The first is, of course, uh, we, we see this as a type of cultural heritage, but um, the cultural heritage is not something that, as Peter mentioned, is 100 or 1,000 years old, but is uh, almost contemporaneous. But when you talk to Syrians who were involved in producing the elements of this archive, the way they see it is that the, the phase of um, democratic struggle that they were involved in is more or less finished at this point. However, uh, they feel it important to maintain these documents because they see that the struggle for 
democracy as they conceive it isn't something that happens at a discrete moment in time, but it happens over an extended period of time. Um, perhaps to their children, they'll be you know bequeathed to the, this legacy of what they did. Um, you often hear Syrians um, bemoan the fact that in previous moments in their history of, of struggle, let's say in the late 70s and early 80s or in the 1950s and 60s, that a lot of what had happened has been lost and forgotten and they don't wanna repeat that. And looking more broadly at the question of democracy, as, as John raised it, you know, um, the French Revolution happened in 1789, uh, but it took 100, 150 years and many more struggles, both political and violent struggles, all sorts of um, struggles to get to something like a real democracy. And same in our country, with a, you know, we had a horrible civil war, we had many other um, instances in which um, democracy was forged as a project over time. and. I think if we see uh, what happened in the Middle East in that light, then this is very much a type of cultural heritage that's going to be important for future generations. And so that's so in terms of who is it for that, I think, is part of the answer of, of who it's for and the most important part of the answer. But um, as John alluded to, I think it's also uh, in addition to being a type of cultural her heritage, it also has a type of universal value. Um, because uh, for, for example, I learned a lot about questions of democracy, self-governance, self um, justice and freedom by reading these documents that I think are relevant to not only our own society, but to other societies uh, that have nothing to do with Syria or the Arab world. Um, because what was happening in these areas were people trying to work out these questions in real time and um, in many ways offering pretty innovative solutions that I think all of us could learn, learn from that. Like we have, for example, a particular conception of democracy, what was emerging in um, these areas in the middle of a civil war or different conceptions of democracy. Um, not that one is more correct than the other, but I think all of them have their value and that therefore these documents have a kind of universal value. So they're also for us in that sense, um, you know, Syrians are the authors, um, and um, in some ways, we are all, we are the um, the readers of this. So I think both of those are, are important. When I go and um, talk to Syrians about this and about what they're um, about the uh, you know tell them about the project, I tend to get two different um, responses. I say eighty percent of the people are really excited because of the reasons I just mentioned. Yeah, and then um, the other twenty percent probably are, are quite fearful, and. Um, and in this case, uh, in terms of uh, types of ethical concerns that I think we have to contend with is that, I mean, their fears are justified, understandable and justifiable. And so we really put the idea of informed consent at the center of, of the process of trying to um, uh, acquire this material. And there's many cases where people um, did not want to, to participate, that of course is their, is their right. And so, uh, but the idea of informed consent is just that to try to, fully explain the project and to um, explain uh, what it's for and what the potential pitfalls are, including in terms of the, the idea that, hey, this, this, the, the aim is to at least have a limited access uh, to the outside world, um, even if that means that names are redacted, that, that we don't, we, our, our aim is not just to keep it and keep it like, in, you know, keep it in secret and not have anybody see it. And so, yeah, some people understandably and justifiably say that they don't want to be part of it. And this is, of course, is a big challenge um, thinking about, just thinking about how to how to move forward on that. But um, generally speaking, the vast majority of people are really excited and wanting to take part. It, just on picking up on that last point, there's a third category of folks too. There's the people who have offered their informed consent. There are the people who have been reluctant to do it. And then there are the people who are dead people who gave their lives fighting to bring freedom to their communities uh, and, you know, took tremendous amount of courage just to do uh, what free societies do every day and take for granted, which is to write a newspaper article and be an editor or something like that. And in those cases, you can't get informed consent and you sort of have to think a little bit, well, um, this isn't, you know, this isn't a legal issue at this point. This is a kind of moral issue that comes to another level. And, and I guess that gets me to thinking, you know, a Waleed about your questions. At, when you tell someone that your, your field of expertise is ethics, most people think about very kind of practical decision-making, legalistic, 
rule following, uh, institution making, and all of that's very, very important. I think those kinds of questions can be resolved pretty well. Um, and we've, we've struggled and we worked with it as part of it is the reason that's one reason this is project has taken some time to, um, you know, to, to advance. Um, but through questions of informed consent and through relationships and you can, and when someone entrusts material to you, that's a pretty good and, and says, yes, please take this, please protect this, uh, please share this message with the world or share it with other Syrians. That's a pretty good indication that, uh, you know, you're on, on strong uh, ethical footing uh, for, the, for the work that you're doing and that you take, if there are other kinds of countervailing concerns, you know, protecting people's livelihood, if this were to get out, this person's life would be in danger. Okay, what can we do? How can we anonymize it? How can we redact? How can we ensure that this story is told without a way that's going to trace back to a particular individual who is still alive or their family uh, and, and cause harm to them? So, Waleed, you asked about whether or not there are certain kinds of commissions we have to go through or, you know, at, at ASU or ethics committees, et cetera. Mostly these are internal decision-making discussions that we've had. And I think we feel pretty confident about the competing interests at stake and the kinds of uh, cautions that we need to take to ensure that those competing values uh, are, pres are, pres are preserved so that we continue forward with the project while also protecting people. Um, so that's sort of one piece of the ethics of the digital humanities, et cetera. But, you know, as I said before, ethics is a field of thinking about human, human good, the pursuit of uh, what it means to live a fully human life, both individually and in community. And the moral questions in this project are so much larger, it seems to me. And if we lose sight of that, we really lose sight of so much. So the courage that it takes for, has, it takes for people to rise up against a government that has overwhelming power to crush them and to do so anyway, in the hopes, in the free, in the hopes that they will succeed seed so that they can govern themselves. That is a deeply moral concern. It is a deeply human concern. Uh, it's not limited to Syria. It's not limited to the United States. It's not limited to one particular period of time. The, the pursuit, the human pursuit of freedom and self-government to govern one's own lives and one's own affairs, that is itself precious. That is itself of great moral value. Uh, and I, I think we have to kind of keep that other ethical piece uh, in line. I, I also want to say that, you know, um, one of the ways that we get this information out is, um, is through great journalists who are not necessarily just local journalists, people like Anand. I mean, Anand, who's taken tremendous risks himself traveling to and from Syria to gather this material to, um, uh, and to, to write the book that he's doing, that's another way of mediating this language. And journalists have long had to deal with questions, well, how do you get a story out there while protecting your sources? This, this is not a new conundrum. We can, we can do this, right? Uh, you don't use the person's name, you change the name, whatever. You use different you know, fictional towns, et cetera. We, we can do this. That's not particularly difficult. But I, again, I don't want to lose sight in there the tremendous amount of, um, of, of courage it takes just to do that work as a journalist these days. Journalists are under tremendous um, attacks uh, from from governments, many of whom are, quote, are putatively democratic governments, including at one point uh, recently, even our own government that was calling uh, journalists enemy of the people. So in addition to human being, the pursuit of freedom being very, very precious, it's also fragile. Uh, it's not something that can be taken for granted and the pursuit of democracy is not something to be taken for granted. And I think, you know, looking back at this project where we are now, I feel in some ways more invigorated and to, to, to pursue it, but even more so because we need to show, be able to sh recognize how freedom and democracy is being pursued in other countries um, because we, it's not just something we can take for granted in, in our own anymore. And uh, that's, that's been a really kind of haunting uh, discovery but one that should um, should continue to to uh, uh, inspire us 
to to recognize what people around the world are are uh, are still striving to uh, to achieve in their own countries. Thank you all. These are really insightful and wonderful discussion. And I want to open it up to the floor if everyone's happy with that. If you could just, you probably all know this because you've probably been a million Zoom calls, but in your reaction bar on the bottom, there's a hand you can raise. If you raise that hand, then we can unmute you and let you ask your question to the panel. We have some time, so, but I can't see all of you at once. Just so you know, I have to look around for you. No questions for the panel so far. We've said an awful lot. And I will say, um, it, and I, I think this is in regard to what all three, four of you might have said, um, funding for this project has been a tremendous issue. And I believe that one of the reasons we're not getting funding is because we are not saying we are going to make this completely open access. That is part of the problem because the current mindset is everything should be open. And the fact that we say up front, we cannot give you that at this moment um, makes them want to say no to us uh, without considering what we're trying to con construct and convey and what message we're trying to send. Um, and that's a bit of a problem. And I think it's a problem more for the library and archive world that, that we won't actually open these things up 100%. Um, and that's why we're not getting the funding that we, in my opinion, so rightly deserve for all the work that you've done. And you know, his life is in danger half the time. Uh, John has been, we're doing amazing things with this and we want the world to know, but um, we need funding. So this, not, this was not a pitch for funding, by the way. This panel was really about the ethics of digitization within a COVID world and why we have to stop and, and take a look back. So I'll be quiet and you guys, uh, please ask your question of the panel. You know, you know uh, Sharon, while we're waiting for uh, colleagues to ask questions, uh, this reminds me, this discussion reminds me with the article uh, that uh, Mahmoud Sabit and Michael Albin wrote in 1977, uh, titled The Tragedy of Manuscripts, uh, or The Tragedy of Arabic Manuscripts. And I think um, I'm reflecting on this discussion. Uh, one now can, uh, can change the title and, 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 and say The Tragedy of Knowledge. Uh, because it's not only about uh, uh, heritage, not only about manuscripts now, it's about the knowledge that is available nowadays, uh, bringing the past to the future, probably. Yeah, absolutely. Good point, Lovely. Thank you. So I can't see any raised hand uh, so far. Um, uh, so, Sharon, what do you think? Would you like to conclude uh, uh, the, the, the seminar? Uh, do you have any other questions? Do you have any other points you, you want to discuss or you want us to discuss? I think you've all done an amazing job with this topic and, and I'm, I'm really pleased. Um, do any of you have closing thoughts? Oh, there's a hand up. Um, we have, yeah. I'm trying to unmute you. I know I said I know how, but hi there. Yay. Uh, thank you. I'm so sorry for taking my time raising my hand. Um, I didn't quite, you know, it, it's it's been a lot to process, but uh, thank you all so much for, for bringing up all of these questions. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Atia Newman. I'm a professor at the Rochester Institute of Technology. Um, I am not a researcher as much as, um, I mean, not in, in, in uh, humanities and war in that sense. Uh, I'm a CG animator and I'm exploring how to preserve culture in digital forms. And I was curious when we were talking, when you were talking about um, uh, of, about making materials open source, I was curious, like, does it, would it make a difference if things were available, but like maybe uh, released in a more strategic time? Uh, is it possible to like, gather material and then, you know, release it in small 
small, less um, damaging ways, I guess. And this is for, for anyone, uh, I'm sorry, like I just, this was to the panel as a question. Anand, why don't you take that one? Yeah, I think that's uh, very possible. Um, you know, we have to think about the best way to do it. Any way we release it will be a type of strategic release, I think. Uh, you know, examples could be either um, kind of limited access so certain institutions, researchers, and others um, are able to view the materials. Another type of model is that it's, it, we just take a kind of greatest hits uh, approach and and you know put it into a, a volume uh, you know for researchers to to and others to to view. So um, we're going to have to contend with uh, the right way to do it. And I mean, a third option is to to wait a couple of years and and release it then, which I think none of us really want to do. But these are all you know different different approaches. One of those we're going to have to pursue. Is there, um, sorry, I'm going to continue to ask questions, um, but is there anything wrong with, say, making some, uh, taking something like this and turning it into a, a fiction slash fiction esque sort of um, form of dissemination where you don't actually like, like you were saying earlier as well, right? You can change names, you can like swap identities and things like that. Um, would that dilute the the veracity of the research if it was actually presented in a way that was almost harmless but not really <laughs> yeah it's a good question it's uh, the challenge i think we face is that uh, these are very rich and laden with names and places and identifying information so i mean they're basically many of them are news articles so you can imagine opening up the new york times and trying to redact every single identifying marker it's quite a process so um i think that's tricky what we were opting for probably is to redact the author's names perhaps um, which might be a happy medium. But, you know, even, even in a place like, um, you know, a country like Syria where governments are happy to mete out collective retribution for the sins of some again, you know, carry that out against many, that's, that even carries some, some risks that we at least have to be mindful of. I, uh, I, I love the idea of, um, of, of creative artists uh, being, taking inspiration from stories and, you know doing something with them i mean the reality is in, in our own society people tend to learn things for better for and for worse from films popular media uh, and things like that so you know that can be a a very useful and, and powerful and influential way uh there you get into the questions of what what counts constitutes creative license and where are you just really taking a a story you know, in a completely different direction that does some kind of, you know, commits some kind of, um, you know, injustice against the story itself to, to, to kind of distort it in some way. But uh, if you're feeling inspired, I would like to encourage your, insp uh, your inspiration there, uh, Atia. I mean, there's, there's the great uh, Dos Passos novel, the USA Trilogy, which consists of uh, um, newspaper clippings. I think those, in those cases, are real clippings, but there's no reason why somebody couldn't, for example, write a novel based on these, based on these clippings and transport the location to some unnamed third country. I think it's a, it'd be a great idea to have swashbuckling digitizers who travel around the world as a, you know, focus of, of you know, popular stories. I, I don't know. Maybe that's just me. But no. But but kidding aside. You know, the the these issues of of uh, of what the expectation is to use with these collections. I want to get back, Sharon, to something that you were saying, which is is what are the expectations of our local partners? You know, we do. I said a couple of times. We do try to really see things as much as we can, or maybe this isn't the right location. Let me start again. Let me say we try to understand that it's our local partners who have custodial responsibility for this material, uh, especially in collections at institutions, especially institutions that might be related to uh, local government. So we do, um, we do try, we respect that as much as we can. And there are some, you know, this is a little bit of a library and our archivist thing, but, and you may have run against it. There are some misconceptions about exactly what the value of the material is too. There are, you know, I've, I've 
talk to executive directors who really think that they don't want to make it open source and open access because of all the money they're going to make by people buying subscriptions to get access to this material and that that has been that's been uh, a question and and we we approach that in the way that okay well that is it's 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 who are we to say that that's impossible? We don't think it's exceptionally likely. Um, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna put these materials online, we don't think that there's a great opportunity to make a lot of money off it. Um, but but um, but we do think that that again, that is it could be a stage, and that's part of the flexibility that I was talking about earlier. Is you know, as you go along, you'll you, maybe you'll find out that there is not, in fact, a, uh, you know, a great market for material on on the, this cultural heritage except that the market will exist for the people, I believe, who are from that community. If you were doing, I, I'll give you an example. The, the work we did in Iraq was at a place called the Kurdish Heritage Institute. The Kurdish Heritage Institute has a tremendous collection of Kurdish, um, of books in Kurdish about heritage issues. So it's cooking, it's dance, it's song, it's things, they're, they're really, really strong on music. So those collections are, uh, when we when we announced that we we had that that was a, now a working digital library, it's it's absolutely terrific, but it's all in Kurdish, so it's all going to be for the Kurdish community. There's not a great um, population. There's scholars, of course, who who can deal with with the Kurdish language and who are interested in that, but mostly it's for Kurds, and mostly we we anticipate it'll be used for people who are celebrating a holiday and maybe want to find recipes, or for people who wonder about, hey, well, gee, wonder where we play the, where this music or this songs are about these subjects, that sort of thing. So, um, so again, I guess it's a, I guess uh, I, I want to say that it's, uh, you know, how you're how you're gonna again, how this open source, open access question plays out is, uh, is still a little in my mind, TBD, and, and hopefully will work um, over time and, and will develop, I think. I think we'll all develop uh, further on this. Uh, there's a question from Lydia Wright. Lydia, can we unmute you and let you speak? Where are you? Okay. Do you want to ask your question, Lydia? Can you hear me? Oh, where'd you go? Where? Hello, Lydia. Well, Lydia was asking about um, perhaps is the problem with sound or Voice um, about libraries and archives that do embargo data on for years, and, and yes, this is true. Uh, most libraries do have this policy of embargoing data for years. You know, given given a time frame in which you will hold something without releasing it. However, um, yes, that could work for us um, at ASU and this particular archive. But I do feel that. Um, it's not something we want completely, completely hidden at this point. We do want researchers and scholars and policymakers to understand that this is here. So I think um, at least having a sample set, you know, uh, I don't know, Anand, what you called it, a top 50 or something, but um, of redacted perhaps uh, newspapers so that we could at least get those um, circulated so people would know at least what we have and that we could share it because embargoing it, um, we don't know how long Syrian conflict could um, last, and we don't know if that might mean that these will never be released in that case. And there's also, with embargoing, there is the possibility of an error or a mistake, and things can occasionally be released that weren't meant to be released. And that it's not a danger or risk that I feel willing to take when human life is involved. And I don't know how Anand or John feel about this, but with the, our, our current archive, I really don't want to have a possibility even that it could accidentally be released. You agree? Yeah. 
I think we'd certainly want to have a very, very careful vetting process of, of how you of how you do those, and you, you want to you'd want to keep your um, you know keep the information that would be available and you know ready to be released just uh, completely separate uh, streamed from the that which is not. Um, yeah, the I mean the the other part of the the challenge is just. I mean, neither Anand nor I are like professional archivists. And, you know, in essence, I mean, if you were to print out all of these things, it would be, you know, it would be like someone giving you four or five boxes of papers and saying, here, protect these for us or share these or use these in your research or et cetera. And you know, it's a lot of materials, 20,000 stories, I think. Um, or, or pages of, of material. So it, it's not, there, there's that factor of, of how you preserve this as well. And, you know, some stories are gonna be very, very important stories. Like what's the, what's the nature, uh, you know, what role should religion play, Islam for, in a predominantly Muslim country like Syria uh, in public life? And there's this, you know, a lot, Anand alluded to this kind of rich debate about that. Uh, but that's, you know, that story is gonna be sandwiched in between some things of quite lesser importance. Uh, so there's a lot of work just to sort of sort through all of that, to translate that, to make it available, to archive it, make it searchable. And that's also part of the challenge and also part of the funding issue. Um, so, you know, in addition to the very practical ethical questions that we've been talking about, there's the very practical um, questions of how much time any one of us can, can 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 commit to something like this and how we seek how we are able to secure funding so that others might be able to do that. Does anyone have any other uh, thoughts or questions on this? Peter, did you want to talk a bit about that or no? Well, then I think actually, um, let me check one thing. I think we might actually be wrapping up a little early, which is probably not uh, something that is saddening many people. Um, I do thank everyone, though, John, Peter, Anand, Walid, Pedro, Le Leal, Aga Khan University, and all of the attendants for coming, please. Um, oh, there is another question, hold on. Yasmin, um, can we unmute Yasmin? Hi, the question's in the chat, but uh, you didn't quite answer the question, where would that be hosted if you had funding? Funding is a general problem for everyone, obviously, and especially when there isn't a direct research question directed to the project, and it's just about preservation and cataloging, it's very difficult to find funding normally. But uh, I think the question of where this would be um, hosted is is crucial so i just wanted to fish that out because you didn't really answer that no I, I, I can begin to answer that um this collection would be hosted at arizona state university um it's currently at arizona state university um and that's where it would be hosted from but um in in the perfect world eventually all of it would come out or we could you know have these top 20 redacted hits come out, but they would live in the ASU library repository um, when we're ready and feel confident that they're safe there. <laughs> they're not, probably not backed up. I'm not gonna speak for Anand and John. I don't know where they're backed up, guys. And uh, may I just ask another question? Is there, what, is the situation with uh, this being material that has been taken out of Syria? I mean, you may have covered it, I'm not exactly sure. It is not cultural heritage as in the sense that it's not uh, old, but it is still cultural heritage. Uh, so is the export, the provenance, is there a provenance issue with it being um, hosted in a library in the US? Uh, no, I don't believe so, Anand, because Anand got the uh, permission to take them 
and and to make a collection and he's a professor at ASU so I, I do not believe that that's an issue but Anand would you like to follow up on that? Yeah, I mean that's exactly right. Um, any any um, document that's included in the collection is done so with the express consent, uh, informed consent of the publishers. The only question, I guess, the gray area, as John alluded to, is those individuals who have been killed in the conflict, and um, in most of those cases, the consent comes from family members. Of those of those individuals, it is a real time issue. This is this is you know while we're talking about this, people are still dying, and that is a bit of um, a problem in that way. And again, you know, it, it really is serious material because it really is serious cultural heritage. And even if ASU hosts it at some point in time in the future it really should be serious. So this is, this is just to bring to light um, what is there, that there is a local voice that is not being heard because of suppression and that um, we feel it's uh, very, very important to give agency to local communities as opposed to the uh, military, the government or uh, some ISIS, Daesh kind of response. The local voice is important in policy making and in means it's it's lost if we don't do something with this material. And, and I would say one one important difference, I mean if you for um, scholars, historians of the American Revolution and those who are thinking about the role that the uh, that the, the press and the colonies played in their newspapers, uh, unlike that time where you were literally printing out the giant broadsheets, most of this comes digitized already. So in terms of thinking about its repository, we, these, are, these are already, even revolutions are taking, places in, taking place in semi-virtual spaces as well. And so, you know, it, the question of who has the thumb drive or who, where is the server located uh, is perhaps a less critical issue for our project than it would be the kinds of uh, proprietary concerns that Peter uh, in his work has to think about um, for physical and anti cultural antiquities. Uh, there, there are a few physical copies of the papers, uh, and, but, but not most of it is available um, digitally. And that also brings the the next step in this process, which is um, sustainability. It has to be held in a place in which it can be sustained. And, and with all digital material, we run into this, right? So um, we have to make sure that we include in any plan going forward, that we include uh, the plan for sustaining this archive until such time that we give it away or we don't, but it needs to be sustained. Um, Betsy Baldwin had a question, and I'm going to just unmute her if I can. Um, well, I'm not very good at this, clearly. Or maybe I'm not in charge of this. Who, who's unmuting people? <laughs> I just think I'm doing it. Uh, I think I it's can. not really a question. I'm sorry. It's not really okay. a question. It was just a point about the, the Boston College oral history that um, it's not, it wasn't, it's not really related to embargo, but I meant what I really was trying to point out is that even with the best intentions of keeping something private for, for a good amount of time can be unsuccessful as they were in that case. I think it was an IRA um, member whose oral history was released back to, and made public. They were compelled. Um, the government couldn't protect them or didn't try, or I don't know, but no, I recall I, it that. was just kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah I recall that um, I, some um, local Boston IRA uh, member was trusted based on that information that was supposed to be private, yes? Yeah, I think so, or something yeah. like that. Yeah, so that, that's, that's another ethical issue. Um, thank you, Betsy. Thank you. Good point. <laughs> Thanks.